Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for our workers. Thank you for their faithfulness. Thank you for their promptness. Thank you. They are always coming. Oh Lord, I pray you will shower your blessings upon everyone in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, where we're weak, make us strong. Where we are faithful, we are fearful, make us firm and courageous in Jesus' name. And whatever we thought we couldn't do, since you have appointed us, we will do everything you have appointed us to do in Jesus' name. Your people will not fail. The grace to be faithful you give to everyone. And every word of God that we hear will transform us and move us forward in Jesus' name. Once again, speak to your servants today. Speak to our leaders today. Speak to our overseers today. Speak to every one of us. And help us, Lord, to be strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. We're coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading verses 6, 7, and 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven lifteth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that it may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ are passed over, a sacrifice for us for sage therefore let us keep the feast not with the old leaven neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth as we look at this chapter that is the first corinthians chapter 5 all the verses from verse 1 to verse 13 you will see it's dealing with a serious matter, a serious concern in the church of the Corinthians. But you understand that the Lord Jesus Christ himself also deals with a similar situation in the church in Tatira. Only that in the church in Tatira, the influence of the leaven of evil had already become pervasive spreading to corrupt and destroy the whole church any evil uh, whatever that evil is of whatever shape of whatever size of whatever description any evil left on church will soon become perceived pervasive destructive and damning when we say pervasive it means it spreads through every area of life and spreads through every uh, section of that community and the passage we're looking at today uses leaven to symbolize evil what kind of evil number one moral evil number two spiritual evil number three social evil number four fleshly evil number five corrupting evil Number six, contagious evil. As you look at the passage, and it mentions leaven, we are commanded to purge out the leaven. Number one, from each life. I want to purge out the leaven from the family. Actually, the family here was involved and affected. And then from the local church. The apostle was writing to the church, and that means then, Every local church is involved here in purging out the leaven. And then from the whole church, we are not just to pray when there is leaven of evil, when there is sin, and when there is evil influence in the church, we are not just saying, we are praying, we are praying, we purge out the leaven. And we are not just to preach. The people that say, I've done my part, I have preached already. It says, go further and purge out the leaven. We're not just to plead. We're begging you. We're pleading with you. Look at this church. And look at how wonderful the church has been. And look at where we're coming from. And we're pleading with the people. 
It says, do more than praying. Do more than preaching. Do more than pleading. Purge it out. Purge it completely. Purge it out constantly. Purge it out without partiality. Purge it out without preferential treatment. As we look at this passage today, I'm talking on purposeful purging for presage holiness and perpetual usefulness. If the individual is going to be perpetually useful, you're useful today, thank God for that, and then you continue to be useful. If you are going to have a local church that is a beacon of light in the community in which we live, and that light is going to be shining more and more to the perfect day, there is something we need to do completely and constantly. There's something we need to do without partiality and without preferential treatment. We we'll purge out the old leaven, purposeful purging for present holiness and perpetual usefulness. There are three things we're looking at in this message. Number one is warning against the pervasiveness of a little leaven is warning against the pervasiveness of a little leaven. Number two, the wages of perversion through a little leaven. The wages of perversion through a little leaven. Number three, a watchfulness and purging from every little leaven. Our watchfulness and purging from every little leaven. Number one, the warning is warning against the pervasiveness of a little leaven. Let's come back to First Corinthians chapter five, and I'm reading from verse one. It says it's commonly reported that there is fornication among you. What that means is, you Corinthian church, everybody in town knows about this. Everybody in your community knows about this. It will stop evangelism. It will stop the effect and the influence of the church. It has eroded into the very fabric of the church at Corinth. Everybody is talking about it. And when you go out and you say, repent and believe in the gospel, they say, I hear you. I hear the story of your church. We are to repent. You have repented. And when you go out and you say, Christ has the power, the power to forgive, and the power to cleanse whosoever will come to him, I hear you. But I hear it's commonly reported in every community, in every local government, in every corner of this city, they're reporting there's fornication among you. If Christ has the power to forgive and the power to cleanse, where is the power being manifested? And then if you're going on and you're saying, oh, come on, you're not in the right place, you're not in the right assembly, you're not in the right location, come to our church because the power of God is moving. Ah, the power of God is moving, but it's commonly reported among you that there is fornication, even sought fornication, as it's not so much named among the Gentiles. It says, uh, you say you are saved, well, even better than you are, and we're more righteous than you are. And we would not dare to do something like that, that you have done, that we're hearing in the Corinthian church, that one should have, that one should take his father's wife, that one should have, possess, take hold of, not just a one-time event, but this young man in the Corinthian church, he was living in an immoral relationship with the father's wife to have, to take, to get into, and to hold, and to possess, and to keep away from the father, the father's wife. We don't even do that in the gentle world. 
if anybody does that in the gentle world there's a curse that will come upon them but you people okay you're talking about grace and you turn your grace into lasciviousness and ye are popped up they were looking the other direction looking at the gifts of the spirit were looking at the miracles they were looking at the signs and wonders and they were still being you see proud of what they had and ye are popped up and not, not rather mourned that she which has done this deed might be taken away from among you for i verily as have sent in body but present in spirit are judged already as though i were present concerning him that has done so done this deed that's why it says in verse 6 your glory is not good your celebration is not good your concentration on where the good worship we're charismatic we have a good worship we celebrate we have a good worship there is joy in our service we sing we enjoy worship and we enjoy coming together and there is togetherness there's fellowship and you rejoice about that he said you're rejoicing your glory your glory your celebration is not good no ye not that a little leaven lifted the whole lamb it was warning them against this little leaven. Then he tells us in verse 8, Therefore, let us keep the feast, the fellowship, the worship. Let us keep that, the church, not of the old leaven. That is what we are doing before we came to know the Lord. Neither was the leaven of malice and wickedness this tongue-talking church and these uh, spirit uh, uh, gifted church they were you know talking away in tongues and doing all those things and yet there was malice and also wickedness among them and they warned them look at galatians chapter 5 i'm reading here from verse 2 galatians chapter 5 verse 2 behold i paul say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Again, we come to another church now. The, the church at Corinth, that was moral. The church of the Galatians, this is doctrinal. Because now, they claim to be saved. Saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. But some people came in and said, you must have circumcision. Look at verse 3. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that is a debtor to keep the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. The people that were adding circumcision and the Jewish rites and ceremonies unto the pure face of the gospel, he said, Christ will be of no profit unto you. Then he goes on to say, Whosoever of you that, just, that are justified, by the law ye are falling from grace and it is introduction of that circumcision of the jews that now is referring to look at verse 7 ye did run well who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth this persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you verse 9 everybody one two three go it's not referring to fornication here it's referring to false doctrine it's referring to the tradition of the jews it's referring to the ceremony of the jews it's referring to the circumcision of the jews that came in to compete with the salvation that is given by christ alone and he said a little leaven leapness the whole lamb matthew chapter 16 in matthew chapter 16 uh, here we find the words of the lord jesus christ himself and he's talking about leaven as well so you understand when we're talking about leaven the thing is very broad there is uh, the doctrinal part there's the moral part and then there is the hypocritical uh, part of the of the pharisees look at matthew chapter 16 verse 6 jesus said unto them take heed and beware 
That's what we we'll call this warning. And it's the warning from Christ. It's the warning from the head of the church. It's the warning from our Savior himself. Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And the disciples did not understand. I were not at the beginning of their Christian life. We're now in chapter 16. And Jesus Christ was not believing them. And at this time, they didn't even understand about the leaven. And if it could happen to the disciples of Jesus like that, how much more ourselves we ought to understand. Look at verse 12. After he explained to them, then understood they how he bid them not beware of the leaven of bread, but, tell me, of the doctrine of of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. It says their doctrine, their tradition, their teaching, because those were the people that concentrated on outward righteousness and the inward righteousness that salvation brought and salvation still brings. They forgot about that. Look at Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, beware of the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees. I'm reading from verse 3. Mark chapter 7 verse 3. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands off, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. That one has replaced inward cleansing. That one has replaced the character that is uh, of the new creature. That one has replaced the salvation that brings inward change and transparent holiness. Look at verse 6. He answered and said unto them, Well, as Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, these people honoreth me with their leaves, but their heart is far from me. I'll be it in vain. Do they worship me? Teaching for, tell me. Teaching for, tell me out loud. Doctrines, the commandments of men. That's why Jesus said, Beware of the leaven of the scribes and Pharisees. That is the leaven of doctrine. The doctrine, that's just the doctrine of men. Everything is only outward. You wash your hands, you wash your feet, you dress like this, you dress like that, and you take that outward comportment as the totality of holiness, and they felt that once they are correct on the outside, they will see God. And Jesus said, beware of that emphasis that forgets about the inner change, the inward change. Look at verse 8. It says in verse 8, for laying aside the commandments of God, ye hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups and many other things like things ye do. And he said unto them, full well, ye reject the commandment of God, that ye should keep your own tradition. Their own tradition has now replaced the real doctrine of salvation of new life, of the grace of God, of godliness through grace. And now Jesus emphasized to them in verse 20. And he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, Deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and they defile the man. They had forgotten about that. All they were emphasizing now was something outward. We're coming to Luke. Luke chapter 12. We're reading from verse 1. Luke chapter 12. Reading from verse 1. In the meantime, when they were, they were gathered together, an innumerable multitude of people, in so much that he trode one upon another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. What is that? 
which is hypocrisy. He said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And so you understand, when we're talking about leaven, it's not limited to just one isolated sin. Every evil, every sin, every corruption, every transgression, if it is permitted, if it is unchecked, it brings real devastating problem on the church. It says uh, the problem of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, hypocrisy. Matthew chapter 23. In Matthew chapter 23, here we're reading from verse 13. Matthew chapter 23, verse 13. But warn to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shot the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer them which are entering in to go in. That was the challenge. They became so religious and it substituted religion for righteousness. And they were not getting to the kingdom of God. And the people that wanted to enter, they were hindering them. They were saying, this is enough. The outward religion is enough. The outward comportment is enough. And if you just obey the tradition of the elders, what we tell you to do. Once you've done that, you're all right. Don't bother about being born again, about you know righteousness, about holiness within and holiness without, about a transparent life. That was the problem. And Jesus said, want to you scribes and pharisees because you concentrate on the outward and the inward you're forgotten look at verse 14 want to you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for ye devour widows houses for he pretends make long prayers therefore ye shall receive the greater condemnation the hypocrisy also extended to prayer you know, they will pray and pray and pray. And there are people like that today. Salvation, they don't know about that, just prayer. Being born again, they don't know about that, just prayer. Preparing for heaven, having that holiness without which no man shall save the Lord. They don't know about that, just prayer. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Night vigil. Prayer here, prayer there, and prayer everywhere. Your mountains will go, your problems will go. And come and see raw miracle. Miracles, miracles. Because we are going to pray. And then the people themselves now, they don't have any personal responsibility, no repentance. They don't have any personal responsibility believing on the Lord Jesus Christ so they can be saved. They have taken over the spiritual lives of the people. They say, we're praying for you. We're praying for you. You go and do whatever you want to do. We are here to pray for you. And you know, that can also destroy our church. That's all we're looking for now. Anytime we want to see the pastor, prayer. You want to see the GS prayer. You're calling him on the phone, it's only for prayer. You want him to come to your locality, only for prayer. You want him to know your children, only for prayer. You want him to interact with your family, only for prayer. Prayer, 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 prayer. And then we cannot emphasize now, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. It's the leaven of the doctrine and the tradition of the Pharisees. And the Lord is warning us and he says, beware, you'll, you'll take caution. Look at verse 15. Who unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, one convert, one disciple, one follower. And when he is made, ye make him a twofold child of hell than yourselves they turned evangelism and soul winning to just bringing people into their religion not into salvation they were not bringing people to a change of life a transformation of life come come and then they bring them and then once they get there they keep them there and they give them something responsibility because they say if we give them something we'll tie them down they'll not be able to go the people are not born again the people are not changed they're just part of the number now we have a 15 converts now we have 20 converts now we have reached a hundred we started from three we started from five and look at it now our congregation we're 
we're growing, we're growing, we're growing. And the people morally, they're becoming worse. The people in character, they're becoming worse. Because it says you make them, when you win them, when you bring them, when you compel them and they stay there in your congregation, they're twofold more, the children of hell, even than yourselves. I pray God will help us. I said the Lord will help us. Look at the problem, verse 25. In verse 25, it says, Won't to you scribes and Pharisees, what did they call them here? Hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. It says, uh, you know, when they want all these uh, people, they will not show them how Christ will cleanse them. How Christ will convert them. How Christ will wash them. How Christ will transform their lives. They just sit them down and they teach them how to conform. Whenever you come in, you wash your hand. Whenever you're coming from outside, you wash your feet. Whenever you're going out, you face this direction. And he gave them rules and regulations. And Jesus said, you make them to conform outwardly. But then, inwardly, there is no change. It's in that level of conformity, outward conformity coming to our church as well. The people come in and we teach them how to do this, how to do this, how to do that. It's only how to do, but how to be. That is the change within. We're not seeing the change within. They do not understand and they're not walking by the word of God. They're walking by what we told them. Look at verse 26, that blind Pharisee cleanse force that with that which is within that's conversion that's transformation that's real salvation cleanse that which is within the cup and the platter that the outside of them may be clean also won't you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for ye are like why unto white sepulchers which indeed appear beautiful outside you come to their fellowship beautiful outside you see the regularity of everything beautiful on the outside you see how they will greet each other and bend to each other and they have taught those people their converse and they have taught all their members they start to behave and you will not see that there's anything missing at all but jesus said you only appear beautiful outside but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men but within are full of tell me i thought you'll say it more firmly they're full of hypocrisy and iniquity i pray the lord will keep the church purged will keep the church safe when people come in we allow them to repent when people come in we make them to understand what repentance is all about they are not joining church they are entering the kingdom of god they are repenting they are turning away from sin and they are really praying their hearts out and real conversion and the spirit of god is bearing witness in their hearts that they're children of god that's what conversion actually means and if it stopped in the church at Corinth all they were doing now is you know speaking in tongues and speaking in tongues and healing the sick and all that and the emphasis of their church is just we have power we have authority we have the gifts of the spirit but no conversions anymore and no clear court character of the real believer anymore you see leaven in its smallest form is pervasive is contagious is contaminating in its evil influence permitting a little moral flaw that does not matter that does not matter that does not matter permitting a little lust of the flesh well everybody has his challenge everybody has his peculiarity and you permit that a little lust of the flesh permitting a little unholy act unholy act that one is against the scripture uh -uh, we're going to be you know uh, kind of air splitting and complaining about everything uh, are we going to be correcting everything uh, you know if you are like that every little thing is important to you that's a little level it will corrupt the whole organization a little occultic practice 
a literal occultic practice the way the people pray and they you know they face a particular direction they're reading something from the bible and then they've dug out some territorial things and things we do not find in the bible and the you know overseer will see how the people are praying and the group pastor will see and the group and the coordinators will see but they don't mind at all they say well that's just it, it makes him effective when he talks like that when he prays like that it makes him well charged and then he can really pray and deliver the people he's giving some extra information not in the bible is a relying on some extra power not in the bible is a cons a, there are people that have that little occultic practice and we say it doesn't matter how about the little inordinate affection a little inordinate affection your affection towards uh, you know a man towards a lady a lady towards a man i just love him but he's not your husband I just like him. It's not your husband. I just I don't understand. I don't know why. I just have a feeling of a interest towards him. That little inordinate affection, it will eventually grow. And if it is allowed, it will get you into trouble. A little malice. A little malice. You know, I want to keep my dignity. I, I discover that, you know, she doesn't understand that somebody is an old person. She doesn't understand that I'm a dignified person. This she doesn't understand my position in society. And so I keep you at your distance and I'm going to stay at my distance. I'm going to avoid all this kind of insult. I know who I am. You see, a little malice like that, that's the, what we're talking about. A little level, a little hypocrisy. What you do in church is different from what you do at home. What you do in private is different from what you do in the public. And then you make up for, you know, whatever it is. And people see you that you are impeccable publicly. But internally, you're imperfect. And you know all the corruption and everything there. And then you're still able to cover that up. A little hypocrisy, like a little lemon, a little false doctrine that comes in and yes we know this is not what we started with and this is not what the bible teaches but you know what and if you if you keep on chasing all these things drive this on the way drive that or that, that on the way when are you going to stop so why don't you just preach what you want to preach and allow that fellow he has a peculiar kind of a lineage and that's what he stands for a little false doctrine will eventually pervade everything a little idolatrous consultation a little idolatrous consultation it is that you know in our village there's a papa there there's a mama there and our people they normally consult them if they're going to travel they consult if they're going to marry they consult if they're going to do this they consult and uh, me i will not join them but you know sometimes they can be correct sometimes they can tell you the right thing and sometimes they can protect you from evil and so you go to them and they I don't do this every time, but I'm afraid of, you know, this journey I'm taking. I don't do this every time. I'm at a crossroad now. If I don't do this, I don't know what will happen. I'm having some intuition. I'm having some things in my mind as if something is coming. And I cannot find my way. A little occultic idolatrous consultation. That's the little leaven there. And this one has this little leaven, a little leaven, a little leaven. And when you bring everything together, the church is going. I pray the church will stand. I said this church will stand. Overlooking a little, a little leaven. It's like you're overlooking a little poison. A little poison is inside your food. And somebody is telling you that there's a little poison, rat poison there in the food. A little, I cannot even see the color. It doesn't change the color of the food. And it doesn't change, you know, the sweetness of the food. Forget about that. I just, you know, go ahead in Jesus' name. Amen. And then you swallow everything. You want to die. You will not die. I say you will not die, but then you must avoid all the poison. That's why it says when that, po when that leaven comes to them, look at what happens. We're looking at Exodus, Exodus chapter 12, 
Exodus chapter 12, and I'm reading from verse 15. Exodus chapter 12, reading from verse 15. Seven days, understand? Seven days for them. Seven is symbolic for us. Seven days of the week makes a whole cycle. And that means the whole of our lives as you now interpret and apply to our lives. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even for the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth, whosoever eateth, tell me uh, what, who is the whosoever? I said who is whosoever? You know, there are people nowadays, although they don't say it, but they act it out. It's like, you know, my place in our church here, you know, my position in this church, before you count one, two, three hundred, they mention my name. And so, because of who I am, the thing may be applied generally to all the other people, but because of who I am, you see, for the little leaven, whoever you are, it doesn't matter. If you take leaven, if you permit that leaven in your life, you are cut off. Look at this. It says, for whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul, tell me, shall be cut off from Israel. Look at verse 19. Verse 19, seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever, that's the word again, whosoever eateth that which is leaven, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. I pray that will take caution in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two now, and we're coming to the wages of perversion through a little leaven. First Corinthians chapter 5. Brothers and sisters, uh, we need to now pay attention because uh, there's a verse here that many people may not understand, and maybe you don't understand. And it is the responsibility of the teacher to explain to us and to expound to us that verse. And sometimes uh, it's not that, you know, I enjoy, uh, you know, saying some things I say, but because we have to be faithful to the word of God. And also because we're training ourselves. And in our training, we need to know more than the ordinary member of the church. God has given you a good position, a great position. And I pray that you'll fit into that position in Jesus' name. So if anybody comes and asks you, hey, about this, what does this mean? Then you'll be able to explain to them. But if I avoid some of these verses, and I say, they won't understand if I talk about that, they might misunderstand us. So if I'm applying it to this or that, then if I'm not faithful, you'll not have the proper understanding. So please understand, I'm duty-bound to explain this to you, and the Lord will give you understanding. I said the Lord will give you understanding. Do you want to learn? Do you want to hear? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 5. To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. You see, there are, I've had, as you know, some people before, many years ago, they need to understand this. They say, if you do this, we'll deliver you to Satan. We'll deliver you to the witches and wizards. And we will tell them to do this against you. Uh -uh. That means you want to pray to Satan. That's not right. That means you want to, you want the help of the witches and with the wizards to come and deal with a member of your church. That's not right. That's not what this is saying. And those who don't understand, they'll be coaching this, they say, to deliver them to Satan. It's like, Satan, come. I have something to give you. I have somebody to deliver into your hand. And this one, hold him very well, torment him, touch on him, and let him see Pepe. Uh -uh, it doesn't mean that. You know what it means? Number one, if you understand what this young man had done, you'll see that this offense was very clear. Look at verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication 
as is not so much named among the Gentiles that one should take, one should have his father's wife. What did this young man do? I said, what did this young man do? He took his father's wife. He messed up with the father's wife. Now you need to understand. There are three dispensations. One, the dispensation before the law. If this was done at that time, what was the consequence? Two, the dispensation within the period of the law. That is, during the time of Moses, at the time of Moses, if this was done, what was the penalty? And then, after the law, before the law, during the law, and after the law. Look at this now. We're coming to Genesis. And I'm reading from Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49. And here we're reading from verse, uh, I'm reading from verse 3. Genesis chapter 49. And we're reading from verse 3. In verse 3, Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength and the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power unstable as water thou shalt not excel because thou wentest up to thy father's bed then the files thou eat he went up to my couch they say Reuben the firstborn of Jacob he did this he went in immorally into the father's wife. What happened? He lost the birthright. He lost the birthright. There's no Satan here. There's you know nothing of witches and wizard here. There's no torment here. There's no sickness here. But he lost the birthright. Let's come to First Chronicles chapter five. First Chronicles chapter five. And we're reading from verse 1. This is before the law, before the law of Moses. When such a thing happened. We're coming to First Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, that's of Jacob, for he was the firstborn. But for as much as he defiled his father's page, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, and the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. So you see that before the law, when something like that happened, the fellow lost the birthright. Now, during the law, that is at the time of the law of Moses, if something like that occurred, what will happen? This is not uh, just going to make the person lose the birthright. We're looking at Leviticus chapter 20. And we're looking at verse 11. Leviticus chapter 20. We're looking at verse 11. Have you opened your Bible? God bless you. I said God bless you. I didn't answer. Leviticus chapter 20 verse 11. The man that lies with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness both of them shall surely be put to death their blood shall be upon them now you understand before the law he will lose the birthright the excellency upon him will be taken away the rights and the privileges of the birthright will be taken away but now during the time of the law that person Together with that woman will be killed and they will be sent to a sudden punishment perdition of hellfire. Now we come to the time in which we are living. That is now after the law, dispensation of grace. Look at this in chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're reading from verse 2. It says, but ye and ye are popped up, and have not rather mourned that he that has done this deed might be killed. I said, might be killed. No. What will be done? 
might be taken away from among you. That's it. Excommunication. That is the thing that should have earned death penalty under the law. You cannot kill anybody now. Now that can you talk about but right now he will be put away from the congregation. Look at verse 13. The last part of verse 13. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. And so you see the same offense before the law. They lost their birthright. During the law they lost their very lives and then after the dispensation of the law one, one thing we need to understand is this This is grace un, unmerited And this is the favor of God unmerited It's done evil And because Jesus died on the cross of Calvary Instead of ending his life Terminating his life And sending him to hell Without his being ready is given chance And the chance is given is that is taken out of the fellowship he'll feel the loss of the fellowship he'll feel the pain that is outside the fellowship and because of that he will repent because he wants the fellowship he loves the fellowship he'll want to come back he'll want to seek the face of the lord so that he'll be saved again now look at verse 5 we need to now explain this to deliver such an one unto satan to deliver such an one unto Satan. What does that mean? All that that means is that you withdraw fellowship from him. It's like when you say to deliver such an one unto darkness. How do you deliver such an one unto darkness? Withdraw the light from him. Take the light away from him. Once you take the light away from him, you have delivered him into darkness. You are not allowing him to hear the gospel, which is the light. The word of God, which is the light in our pathway, you have delivered him to darkness because you withdraw. What should do him good? And you excommunicate him because he's now outside, is delivered unto Satan. When it says, when you deliver somebody to the enemy, what does that mean? Does that mean you look for a sinner and say, enemy, come. I've got somebody for you. I know you'll be looking for him. Here you see, I deliver him to your hand. You don't do that. You withdraw protection from him. Once you withdraw protection from him, you have delivered him unto the enemy. You put away that person from the fold of the shepherd and therefore you have exposed him to the wolves so what it means is excommunicate him drive him out put him away because he's adamant because he's hardened because he doesn't see that what he has done is wrong and he's still rejoicing and boasting and being popped up Therefore, you excommunicate him. That's what it means. Deliver him unto Satan. Look at verse 5 again. For the destruction of the flesh. For the destruction of the flesh. What's that talking about? That's talking about what the devil will do. Once the protection is up, is delivered unto Satan. And now the punishment or the suffering or the sickness this is the work of the devil look at this job i'm reading from job chapter 2 verse 7 job chapter 2 verse 7 is not under the protection that is this man we're reading about under the protection of the shepherd of the savior of the messiah is excommunicated we have withdrawn the light of the gospel away from him now job chapter 2 verse 7 it says in verse 7 so went satan forth from the presence of the lord and smote job with sore boils from the sole of his foot even unto his crown that's what the devil has always wanted to do and now that this person is uh, sent out and he doesn't have the light of the promise of God, the light of the provision of God, and the light of the participation with the people of God. 
That's what happens. Satan then uh, takes his turn to torment him, to attack him, to afflict him. We're looking at uh, Psalm 109. Psalm 109. I'm reading from verse 6. Psalm 109, verse 6. Said thou, a wicked man over him. Let Satan stand at his right hand. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned and let his prayer become sin. You see, this man that is turned out, his prayer is not acceptable because if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And his prayer becomes a sin and abomination. And he says, let his days be few, let another take his office. He's talking about excommunication is driven away actually this one is true about judas iscariot and there's uh, so we understand when somebody is delivered to satan torment comes affliction comes sickness comes the destruction of the flesh comes come back to first corinthians chapter 5 first corinthians chapter 5 verse 5 to deliver such an one unto satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. That's the beauty of the gospel. That's the wonder of the grace of God. Look at what the man has done. And instead of losing the birthright forever and ever and never coming back, and instead of being totally destroyed by the devil, that there's no chance and is put to death, it says there'll be temporary torment. There'll be temporary affliction. And it will be for the destruction of the flesh so that these will now bring him to number one submission and these will bring him to supplication and these will bring him to salvation because of the suffering because of the torment and because of the pain he's going through and he's outside the church he's a communicated he remembers and he says if i were in the church now i'll send in a prayer request but i cannot do that now if i were in the church now i will see our local pastor i cannot do that now if i were in the church now i will see our pastor i cannot do now now i'm outside and now he's suffering he says, Lord, I don't want to die in this condition. He knows about going to hell. I don't want to go to hell. And the suffering brings him to number one, submission. Number two, supplication. Number three, salvation. That's what it means when it says, so that his soul, his spirit will be saved in the day of the Lord. We're coming to Psalm 107. Psalm 107. And I'm reading here from verse 17. Psalm 107, verse 17. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities afflicted, their soul abhorreth all manner of meat. And they draw near unto the gates of death. Then they cry. You see that? Because of the suffering, because of the affliction, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble. And he, what does he do? God is a good God. Everybody say, God is a good God. A loving, gracious God. He saves them out of their distresses. And he sent, verse 20, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. The suffering is to lead them to pray. The suffering is to lead them to call and cry unto the Lord. Yes, they'll have suffering. Yes, they'll have sickness. Yes, they'll have sorrow. But that sorrow will lead them to submission, to supplication, to salvation. Second Corinthians chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 10. Second Corinthians chapter 7. We're looking at verse 10. It says, for godly sorrow walketh repentance. You see that? Godly sorrow. Because it's excommunicated, the light is withdrawn from him, and the spiritual food is withdrawn from him, and the protection of the shepherd is withdrawn from him, is now outside in danger of being devoured by the wicked one. He has sorrow. For godly sorrow walketh repentance to salvation, not to be regretted of, but the sorrow of the world walketh death. We're coming back to 1 Corinthians 
chapter 5. First Corinthians chapter 5. We come now to point number 3. It tells us there is something we need to do. When we see such situations like this, and this commandment is given to every one of us, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're reading from verse 7 and from verse 8. Verse 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that she may be a new lamb. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that she may be a new lamb. As ye are unleavened, for even Christ at Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Look up here for a moment. You see the situation in that church. The culprit, the guilty one, is this young man. The family in which that happened is this family of this father. And the church is the local church at Corinth. And then when it says, put out therefore the old leaven. Number one, there's personal purging. Personal purging. Number two, there is family purging. Look at the father and he has gone into this kind of unfortunate situation and the family here is being told now purge out the old leaven and look at the local church there is church purging and look at verse 8 let us keep the feast not with the old leaven of uh, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness you see in situations like that there are people that will take sides with that father they say this boy, this young man did that to this our friend and then they'll hold malice with that boy because their friend, the father of the boy had been injured and then wickedness may also surface that okay, you cannot control yourself and that is what you've done we're going to forget Christianity now and forget grace and forget Christian character will deal with you and you merit it will serve you what you actually merit wickedness can come in you say no don't do it like that that's not how to purge that's not how to solve the problem there must be no malice in your heart against the young man you're wanting to repent and the church is doing the right thing leave it in the hands of the church is a put out so that there will be mercy eventually when he suffers but let that be from the hand of the lord himself let there be no malice. Let there be no wickedness. And now look at the father. And look at the wife. And look at what the son had done. Father, the father is likely to have malice against the son. And also wickedness against the wife. You made yourself so cheap. And this is what you have done. Okay, I'll see what to do to you. The corrupt nature, the depravity of the human heart can come in. And Paul the Apostle said, no, that's not how to purge it. You first of all, you purge yourself personally from the malice and from the wickedness. And so number one, there is personal purging. As we have studied this in the scriptures, and then you want to preserve your righteousness and preserve your holiness, cleanse yourself. From all filthiness and defilement, experience genuine restoration if you have been affected. Experience genuine salvation. Remove the objects of sin. Remove the objects of sin. Look at what has happened in your family. This has happened. Okay, I'm sorry. All right, I forgive you. Are we going to leave the wife and the son, young man like that? You will rearrange your family and you will not be living with that young man so that and the wife will not be a temptation to him anymore. Enlighten your own conscience with the word of God. That's purging yourself. This has happened. My conscience, you know, was quite about that as if this is not too bad after all. Enlighten your conscience with the word of God. Keep yourself pure and be sincere with yourself. 
be sanctified and maintain a soft, submissive, sensitive conscience and live in the conscience, in the consciousness of the presence of God. Know that everything you do, every act of your life is being looked at by the Lord and therefore you purge yourself. Let's talk about the family. How do we prevent something like this in the family? Because if this has happened and the family goes on business as usual and there is no family purging, that thing can be repeated again. And it's going to stop the power and the effectiveness of the church in that community. What do you do as a family? Remove the stumbling blocks from the family. Stumbling blocks from the family. You brought somebody into the family. Maybe, maybe not your son. You brought somebody from your village. You brought somebody from the local church. You brought somebody, and that fellow is defiling your wife or defiling your uh, children, your daughters. You're not just going to say, okay, because of love and because he doesn't have a place to stay. And, you know, human uh, kind of love and consideration uh, should uh, consider that if I throw him out now, what's going to happen? If you don't throw him out now, what's going to happen to your daughters? What's happening to your wife? Do you want them to, you know, be influenced and to go to hell? You're going to remove the stumbling block from the family. And you keep the privacy of the parents sacred, the father and the wife. You keep the privacy of the parents sacred. What does that mean? There are some families, husband and wife, and they have growing sons and daughters, and they all live in one, in one room. And when, uh, you know, the husband wants to, you know, make love to the wife, you think those children are sleeping? No, they are not sleeping. And you're teaching them corruption. You're teaching them defilement. As the family is growing, the way you approach the family is that you find accommodation so that your growing boys, they be in a separate room, your growing girls, they be in a separate room, and daddy and mommy will be in a separate room. You keep the dignity of the parents, and then you keep the privacy of the parents who ensure genuine salvation for all the children, all the members of the family. Whatever has happened might have happened. Much water might have gone under the bridge. But let's make correction so that by the grace of God, there will be holiness in the family. Practical holiness. There is theoretical holiness. There is holiness in the Bible. There is holiness in doctrine. There is holiness on the note. There is holiness on the CD. But now practical holiness in the family that we know if they act like this you keep your territory i keep my territory and we don't cross the line that will bring any shame on the family any reproach on the family that's practical holiness number one there's practice there's personal purging number two there's family purging tell me number three Church purging. Church purging. You see, in the church, love should be central. But make it scriptural love, not sentimental love. You see, sentimental love will tend towards lust. Sentimental love will tend towards the love in the cinema house and the love in the world and the love that will bring immorality. But now we should maintain scriptural love, not sentimental love. We should preach holiness and preach holiness clearly. Make it very clear. If we just say without holiness, no man shall say the Lord, I hear that. But what's holiness? Make it very clear and make it scriptural. Make it convincing. Preach holiness convincingly and preach holiness constantly pursue heaven and not number pursue heaven and not number you see we as preachers there is temptation to pursue number rather than pursuing heaven jesus did not die just to make us have a big church a large church and great number 
He died so that souls can be saved. He died so that people will repent, turn away from sin, and their lives will become totally different, and they'll be holy within and without, and they will get to heaven. And so, in your ministry, this part of purging the church, you concentrate on holiness that will take people to heaven rather than concentrating on building up the number. Purging the church requires that you will not be ignorant, you will not be indulgent, you will not be indifferent. Number one, be not ignorant. Be not ignorant. There are pastors that are totally ignorant of their congregation. They don't know what is going on. They're so active and they're, you know, from here they go to that other meeting and from here they go to that other place. They're evangelistic and they're doing prayer, they're doing counseling, they're doing all that and they're praying for people. And you can tell that they really, they really love what they're doing. But they don't know anything going on in the congregation. They don't know anything going on in the families of the people. Be not ignorant, be not indulgent, be not indulgent. There are people who are indulgent. If they hear that something has uh, happened, they say, you know what? In the olden days, good old days, we used to say, stand up there, sit down there, don't go there, don't go there, don't go here. But you know now, as we get older, we need to be like grandma and grandpa. That we just say, children, do you think that's all right? I hope you are not, uh, you know, hurting yourself there. And then they'll say, my brother, I hope everything is all right. Uh, people are complaining, but make sure that, you know, things are all right. Uh, you know, don't give them what to talk concerning you. Why don't you shape up? Anyway, God, God is a God of love and God of grace. They're indulgent. They cannot be firm and say, my brother, this is not right. This cannot be. Because, you know, if this continues like this, you will not get to heaven. Because God is not an impartial God. He is impartial as a judge and is going to judge this. Marriage is honorable in all, but the bed undefiled and the adulterers and the adulteresses and all mongers, God will judge. You are firm with the word of God. You are not ignorant. You are not indulgent. You are not indifferent. To be indifferent means, you know, the last time I visited the doctor, he told me that, what work do you do? Because it looks like uh, you are stressed out. It looks like you deal with stress a lot. And it's affecting your blood. It's affecting your brain. It's affecting your, you know, your lungs. It's affecting everything. And therefore, if you want to live right and enjoy your health, remove stress from your life. Don't be stressed at all. Anything happening, I'll say, doctor, how can I do that? Because, you know, we are supposed to maintain holiness. Ah, he said, if you are maintaining holiness like that, it's going to affect your health. You will die young. How old are you now? I'm 39. 39? And you are like this? I'm telling you, remove stress completely. So how do I do that, doctor? Whatever people do, just be indifferent. See, I don't care. Just tell yourself, I don't worry. Just tell yourself, I don't mind. Just tell yourself, it doesn't bother me. If you leave people to do what they are adults, they will leave their lives. The doctor does not understand anything. He doesn't understand your charge and your commission. He says, let them take care of themselves and you just be indifferent. If you're indifferent, that might improve your health that way. But when the reckoning time comes, what will God say about you? You're unfaithful. And then he throw you to the other side. I pray it will not happen to you. You will not be indifferent. I said you will not be indifferent. Your daughter is, uh, you know, doing something. And your son is chewing the, you know, the marijuana and something. And he say, don't stress yourself. Be indifferent. Just overlook everything. You know? When the young man becomes mentally deranged and he comes back home and he wants to destroy everything, you know, how can you be indifferent at that time? That child might even be the one that will kill you. It is time to rise up and talk and say, no, this will not be done. And you punch that church. And then when you get older, you'll have peace of mind in Jesus' name. Be fearless, be firm, and be fierce against sin. If you're fearful and timid, if, uh, you know, somebody, they're doing something wrong, and then you are coming, and they keep on doing it. If on trade, they 
they keep on doing the thing they say you know they're trying to test your backbone they're trying to test your conviction they say something wrong they're doing something wrong and then you are the pastor you are coming and they keep on doing it i like to see how you are going to act in that situation i pray you'll be fearless i said i pray you'll be fearless you'll be firm and you'll be firm and fierce against sin then you preach practical holiness not just theoretical holiness preach it practical holiness and you preach that holiness that will take us to heaven think about this now if the people that are listening to you if your message is the only message they hear they don't hear any other message in from any other place it's your message in its series in its emphasis in its power able to take people to heaven that's what you think about and then if you do that you will purge and the lord will help you in jesus name in your purging you'll also pray so that the help of the lord will come to you in that purging in jesus name give me a good good leadership amen we're looking at second timothy chapter 2 second timothy chapter 2 and i'm reading from verse 21 second timothy chapter 2 verse 21 if a man therefore purge himself purge himself from these it shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work you are going to serve god in a better way and the work of the Lord is going to prosper in your hands. We're coming to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. And I'm reading here from verse 6 and verse 7. Psalm 51. We're reading from verse 6 and verse 7. It tells us in verse 6, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the inner and in the hidden parts, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with Esau. And I shall be clean, you'll be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, we're reading from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 6, reading from verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his stream filled the temple. Above each two the seraphims, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly, and one cried unto another, and said, Holy, 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 is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door I moved at the voice of him that cried, and the, and the house was filled with smoke then said i woe is me he realized when he saw the glory of god when he saw the holiness of god when he saw the beauty and the majesty of the almighty god he realized what was still uh, lacking in his life he said because i'm a man of unclean leaves and i dwell in the midst of the people of unclean leaves for mine eyes have seen the king the lord of hosts then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken of the tongue from up the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth. The Lord will touch you tonight. And said, Lo, this has touched thy lips. Thine iniquity is taken away, thy sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, everybody, say that aloud. Say that with consecration. Here am I, send me. He'll purge us. He'll prepare us for greater service. We'll be more useful than ever before in Jesus' name whatever has gone wrong let's take it to calvary let's take it to the cross of jesus let's take it to the blood of the lamb he'll wash us and cleanse us and purge us and he'll prepare us for greater ministry and greater service in the kingdom in jesus name let's rise up now and talk to the lord in prayer 
the Lord is merciful, the Lord is kind, the Lord is good, and the Lord is uh, going to favor us with his mercy and his goodness. Call upon him. If there's anything to be taken away, take it away. If there's anything to be purged, purge it. If there's anything to, you know, correct, correct it, and the favor of the Lord will be abundant to your life in Jesus' name.